Hey, hello, good evening, learners. Welcome back to another session on MEG7. It's me, Anand Krishnamurti from RC Cochin Kalur. Welcome back to another session on MEG7, Indian Writing in English. During our first five sessions, which took place a month back, or maybe a month and a half back, we discussed the paper MEG7, Indian Writing in English, not in entreaty, but we, we came across a few novels and also we read a few poems. We recited, we tried to explore them and we tried to dig into the inner meanings of those poems. And it was a delightful experience for me as well. I still remember discussing the helplessness of a father in selling his daughter uh, a boatman, that is, to a tourist. So we, we, we discussed quite a lot of interesting poems back then. Also because you have annotations for MEG7. So keeping that exam point of view in mind, we discussed quite a few poems last time around. And we also discussed a few novels here and there. Again, I quite distinctly remember Midnight's Children, or Teaching Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie to you. It was real fun unveiling the magic of magic realism. So taking it from there, the catchword today is the name is Bond, not James, but Ruskin Bond. So today we'll discuss Ruskin Bond. And uh, before we discuss Ruskin Bond, this week, as we have five sessions rallied up from today up until Friday, 26th to 26th, 22nd to 26th, I'm sorry, 22nd to 26th of May, 2023, from 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m., we'll meet again on a daily basis and discuss for two hours various unexplored works from MEG7. And I promise to look as much as I can to help you out in this regard. And uh, as we move on, as we have already discussed poems as well as novels, one stone that I left untouched during the first lag of a sneak was short stories. Short stories are like pocket dynamos. They may appear to be small in size, but they can have a huge meaning or quite a huge replications. And they can be used to carry home quite a lot of interesting messages. So as we talk about such strong messages, you have an entire block, block number six in MEG7, titled short stories. Given the fact that in this cluster you have opted MEG 14, modern Indian literature, uh, contemporary Indian literature and translation, it also has two blocks, if I remember correctly, which includes quite a lot more short stories. So one word of reservation has to be made about short stories before we proceed to any particular writer or their works. I've already revealed the suspense that we'll be beginning with Ruskin Bond today. As usual, as a starting point, I could have begun with anybody. Your block begins with R.K. Narayan's two amazing short stories. Then there are uh, stories of nihilistic or existentialist angst. There are diasporic short stories. There are feministic short stories, all of which we'll explore as this week progresses. But why did I choose Bond for a starting point? I'll come back to that a little while later. Just be a bit patient with me. For the time being, let me get started with the term short story. When we speak about short stories, it is not an age old genre, unlike say for instance, poetry or drama. Short story, as a matter of a fictitious point, is something that sprung and got or gained popularity in the late 19th or early 20th century. When we speak about the beginning of any genre, when I say genre, you take the case of uh, poetry, you take the case of drama, you take the case of uh, um, any literary prose, pro poetic genres, 
we could easily track back its origins to Greco-Roman tradition. We speak about literary criticism and theory, for instance. We can easily track back to Aristotle and uh, Plato and uh, Longinus and uh, uh, Arist uh, the other guy, uh, Horace, and so on and so forth. The moment we speak about drama, we speak about its Greek origin in the Acropolis to please the Greek god. The moment we speak about poetry, again we go back to Greece. Then we have these forms reinforced and re-emerging under the Elizabethan or pre-Elizabethan and post-Elizabethan Britain. But then when we speak about several new forms, Again, in England, there is also another genre that comes in called essays. When you learn MEG3, even though you learn novels, you will also come simultaneously in contact with novels, sorry, essays. And we'll come across essays of Sir Francis Bacon, then uh, personal essays by Charles Lamb, and so on and so forth. Then, we, then there is Addison Steele. And uh, when it comes to America, we have Ralph Waldo Emerson. Henry Thoreau, and so on and so forth. So uh, essay as a genre came late. And that's a short genre. Similarly, an art form emerged somewhere in the late 19th or 20th century called short story. Perhaps 20th century was a hub of short forms. Another similar reference that I can give you easily is one act plays up until then we had five act plays from william shakespeare by the time we reached william congreve and uh, the restoration period and all it came down to four act three act by the time we reached oscar wilde importance of being uh, the importance of being earnest and eventually we come across one act plays by the time we come to the 20th century america with the emergence of eugene o'neill or tennessee williams and so on and so forth so similarly, well, one act play emerged due to various reasons, which does not fall under a purview for the time being. But maybe to keep it as simple as five to six sentences, I can give you the example of how cricket evolved, the game of cricket evolved. Cricket initially was a five-day affair. It still is. It was called test cricket. But in the late 1980s, or much before that, perhaps due to the World Cup, the ODIs emerged. 60 over format emerged, and later it became 50 50, which is called ODIs, one day internationals. As time progressed, people didn't have time to wait a whole day in front of the team to watch their favorite team losing. So by mid, early, early 2000, uh, 21st century, early 2000, say 3, 2005 onwards, it shrunk further. And we saw the beginnings of uh, 2020s or T20s as they are called. And IPL, needless to say, is one of the cash winning leagues of the world, cricket leagues of the world. And now if you look at the Arab countries, there is another form of cricket called T10, 10 over contests, 10 over side contests. So similar, people were fed up going to watch five act plays or three act plays. And with the arrival of cinema as a rival art form, people started to, in a way, abandon the theater houses. So in order to overcome these problems, stalwarts like Eugene O'Neill or Tennessee Williams brought in a lot of theatrical devices like music, sound, stagecraft, and so on and so forth, and also shrunk the size by one or maximum two acts, thereby re-inviting the theatrical audience to the win, to the stage. And uh, to a certain extent, that did succeed. And these people also had their ulterior motives. If a one-act play succeeds, they could turn it into a Hollywood screenplay and get good bucks. So that was also there. So similarly, short stories also emerged as another pocket genre. I have been speaking for quite a while now, so maybe let me take a second's break and just ask you, how short 
is actually a short story. Of what length can we call a short story or approve a short story to be a short story? Feel free to unmute yourself and express yourself. I can see nine people in the house. I urge you, this is not a rocket science. This, there are no absolute answers either. I'm just asking you for your understanding of the word short story. How short or how long is a short story in your opinion? So talking about short stories, I'm not going to elaborate on these words due to the lack of time, but let me introduce to you a few terms. You may go back, go back to your blocks or maybe go back to Google or any other sources that you are comfortable dealing with and uh, have a basic reading about what these things are. All right. I just have four terms in the chat box, flash fiction, short story, novella, novel. You all know what a novel is, so I'm not going to, you know, take my time on that. And uh, if at all, when we come and discuss MEG3, we'll discuss what a novel is, what its origins are. We'll talk about E.M. Foster, Ian Watt, and so many other people. But then flash fiction is another latest genre, a postmodern genre which is really short, just like we speak about haiku, for instance, uh, the distinction has to be made between short story and novella. A prime example is one that Malayalis may be easily, uh, Malayalis may easily recollect with or resonate with. There is this writer in Malayalam called Vaikam Muhammad Bashir. Well, as a matter of fact, he's no more, but then he's a legend. Vaikam Muhammad Bashir. Is Vaikam Muhammad Bashir a short story writer or does he write novellas? This is for Malayalis out here, if any of you are there. Is Vaikam Muhammad Bashir a short storyist or does he write novellas? So that's a very tricky question because his writings are let's say a hundred hundred plus words uh, pages long and uh, it's difficult to call it a novel novel proper but then they are often addressed as novellas but then he has also written short stories that are 60 to 80 pages long so short story is actually not basically about length it is rather like Venkatesh quite rightly observed it's more about the fewer number of characters, plot development, complexities, and so on. If the plot is too complex, then perhaps that would end up being a novel. If the length is too long amidst this chaos, inevitably, that ought to be called a novel. Short story is not really about size. It's not about Again, you spoke about word lengths, 1,000, 1,500, or 5,000. Mind you, an MS Word full page would carry 350 to 400 characters. And an MS Word page is actually double folded to make two pages, or rather four sides, right? So basically, 800 words or 800 to 1,000 words makes four sides of a book. So if you are beginning to say four pages means a short story, it may not always be the case. There could be pages which would be, there could be stories which would be 16 to 20 to 30 pages long and would still be called a short story. And short story as a genre, just like I said about Eugene O'Neill and Tennessee Williams and how they popularized one act plays in America. Short story also as a genre became experimented and popularized in America. Again, this is a personal observation. You may beg to differ, but my observation is that 20th century America had with it a string of masters who take short story to newer heights or greater heights. The best one to start with is Edgar Allan Poe. You will all be aware of him. He is accredited with a lot of things. He's a poet. 
is a critic. He is regarded as the father of detective fiction. Also, he has written quite a lot of short stories and also known as a dark romanticist. Again, a word for you to Google if you want to explore that word. Dark romanticism versus transcendentalism of Toro and uh, Russo. Transcendentalism, yes. So these are things that you could go back and refer. So talking about Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe, he has written quite a lot of short stories. And he fathered uh, what may be called as detective fiction, thereby adding popularity to short story as a genre. Another master craftsman was Mark Twain. And another contemporary of Edgar Allan Poe who popularized short stories was Nathaniel Hawthorne. Again, in dark romantic tunes. I still remember and keep referring to his short story, The Birthmark, just in case you haven't read it. It's a must read. If you Google this, if you Google as The Birthmark short story full by Nathaniel Hawthorne, you will get a four page PDF, an abridged one. You will get a 16 page PDF and a 32 page PDF. That's how short, that's how short a short story can be, mind you. So The Birthmark is an amazing short story where, um, the central character is a scientist. He falls in love with a girl, a pretty girl, a really pretty girl, whose name is Georgiana. Georgiana has quite a lot of suitors because she's pretty. But then she falls for Aylmer. And once they marry, Aylmer notices that there is a mole on her cheeks. And that mole is in a hand-shaped position. And Aylmer finds that to be a disturbing sight. He says, without this, you would look absolutely perfect. And he forces her to undergo a surgical procedure. And what happens is the climax of the short story. So there are quite a lot of interesting short stories. If I if I go on talking about a Guerrilla and Poe uh, and Twain or uh, Hawthorne, or even for that sake, the master of short stories, William Sidney Porter. What is his pen name? William Sidney Porter from America. We are discussing Indian English literature, but let's start from America. William Sidney Porter. The writer who has written The Cop and the Anthem. The Last Leaf. Two Strangers. After 20 Years. And quite a lot of other interesting stories. Anybody? Who's William Sidney Porter? Yeah, they also associated with that story of Jim and Della. What was it? The gift of Sir, the Sir, O. Time. Henry? O. Henry, precisely. O. Henry. So, O. Henry took American short fiction to another level. What was special about O. Henry's short stories? There is something peculiar or unique about O. Henry's short stories. The moment we say metaphysical poets, we say conceits. Similarly, the moment we say, oh, Henry, what is the peculiar attribute of his uh, short stories? Anybody? So he romanticizes the commonplace and the common people. Okay, taken. But that's I'm, I'm talking about the uniqueness. There is one thing that is common to O. Henry's short stories alone. So he uses like situational irony in his work. Okay. You're, you're close, you're close. Just proceed a little further, you will get the answer. So, surprise endings? Exactly. Also called as? Surprise plot endings twist. are also called as? Twists. Yes, plot twists. So, O. Henry introduced surprise endings or plot twists to his short stories. And hence, there were quite a lot of readers to his writings. And he took short story to the next level. When it comes to India, Indian short story was really at its infancy. And uh, your block would have different opinions though. You have your first unit which talks about what a short story is, what its history is. And it speaks about the six basic elements of a short story. And uh, these things I'm not going to deal with because these are things that you're supposed to 
already be aware of. So, and there's no, no rocket science in block one. You simply read that, you will get an idea of how a short story is supposed to be like and uh, what are the basic elements and so on and so forth. And E.M. Foster's definitions in particular. So I'm not taking you there right now. But nonetheless, the moment we speak about short fiction in India, again, we'll have to go back to those three Tayo writers who popularized short fiction in India as much as defining the ways in which modern Indian novel was to go. They are none other than R.K. Narayan, Mulkraj Anand, and Raja Rao. But among the three, the other two, the latter, that is Mulkraj and the Raja Rao, focused a lot more on long prose, that is novel. Whereas sir, R.K. Narayan... Sir, sorry to interrupt. So, as you said, we have to focus on E.M. Foster's statement. So, in the book, he says, uh, E.M. Foster gives a, a distinction between a simple narrative and a plot. He says, the king died and the queen died is a story. The king died and the queen died of grief is a plot. So, please explain yeah. this. That is, see, okay, can, would you mind repeating the statements once again? I'll, I'll make it yes, very sir. clear. Okay. King died the, king and died. the king died and the queen died, right? In, is a story. Is a story. No. The king died yeah. and the queen died of grief is a plot. Yes. So what is the difference? The king died and the queen died is just a narration, a, a, a story, what do you call a, a situation that you are exploring. But the moment you say the queen died of grief, yeah, precisely, Pritiji, the causal relationship is established. There is plot, there is drama. Right. It needn't be the queen died of grief. It could also be like the king died and the queen was beaten to death. It becomes far more exciting. It becomes a better plot then. Am I clear? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, your good name, please, because it says Feel Zone. Sir, actually, I can't change it. It's my YouTube channel's name, Feel Zone. Yeah, that's okay. What's your name? So my name is Shivangi Singh. Shivanki, all right, fine, thank you. Okay, because thank we you, keep sir. interacting, no, it's better to call you by name than, you know, your YouTube channel's name, so that's why. Thank you. Okay, so, where, yeah, so I was talking about how those three were into popularizing prose and how, unlike the other two, R.K. Narayan was equally interested in writing short stories. There are quite a lot of stories with different flavors that R.K. Narayan penned especially you should remember the times 1930s 1940s the indian independent movements going on and so on and so forth so we'll come to that a little while later but i'm just taking you through the blocks very quickly so you have rk narayan and uh, yeah um just give me a second i think oh yeah only two is rk narayan then you have this uh, arun joshi He's a very exciting character to whom I'll come back sometime this week because he's an existential law. You know, the, re the reason why I like discussing Arun Joshi with my MEG learners is if you open unit three and read his intro, the intro says an existentialist novelist writing in line with Albert Camus and Franz Kafka. Arun Joshi shifted his focus from social realism to psychological realism. Imagine the stature that we attribute to Indian English writing. We always look at it as a low-grade literature compared to the elitist canonical British writings. And immediately you open your block, Unit 3, it says, it equates Arun Joshi with stalwarts like Franz Kafka and Albert Camus. So just in case you are not familiar with Arun Joshi, you will be taken aback. And maybe if a Britisher is reading it, he may find, he may take it with a pinch of salt. He may be a little bit offended. Right? Who is this Arun Joshi? How come he be equated with Kafka and uh, um, these uh, stalwarts, uh, stalwart writers like Albert Camus or Jean Paul Sartre? Something that these people would wonder. But trust me, the moment you start reading Arun Joshi, he's an engrossing, engripping writer. 
the block has it right again two words for you to google social realism versus psychological realism again the word psychological realism reminds me of eugene o'neill and his masterpiece play express uh, expressions play uh, emperor johns so what is psychological realism is again something for you to explore but we'll come back to arun joshi sometime later this week you have the only american from our village a short story by arun joshi prescribed for your study and uh, then you have a trip into the jungle a trip a trip into the jungle actually reminds me of quite a lot of savage literatures like the lord of the flies for instance if you haven't read before my session you may go back and uh, read say for instance a work like the lord of the flies by william golding and just in case you have read the blocks and you have read arun joshi's uh, short story that i mentioned right now Yeah, I'm sorry. There is a slight okay. A trip into the jungle. If you read a trip into the jungle and attempt a parallel reading of the Lord of the Flies, it would be really interesting. Similarly, as you proceed with your blocks, you will come across quite a lot of gripping tales with Subhadra Sen Gupta's The Fourth Doctor, Raji Narasimhan's A Toast to Herself. These are all. daily realities that most of women would be able to connect so is the case with shashi desh pande the miracle and geeta hariharan's gajar halwa gajar halwa is actually another gripping read you come across the miseries of the poor and how they have to migrate from one city to another in search of fortunes and live a discreet life devoid of the basic human rights quite dixonian to be honest charles dickens the way he writes this stories you could find a similarity in gajar halwa so we'll explore all that this week sometime but then today i'm taking you straight away to block 6 or unit 6 to be precise and in unit 6 you have the glamorous the one and only the ruskin bond when i say the word the uh, when i say the word or say the name ruskin bond again i'll have to digress a little bit to talk to you about a few genres prime most among that is children's fiction just like i keep saying indian english writing is seen in a derogatory sense children's fiction in the academia was always seen from a derogatory perspective we see that as silly frivolous time pass narratives up until a point when critical theories look back and uh, reinvented children's fiction mostly the focus was on how and why or the hidden traces that children fiction has it's not only about prose okay if you google and explore the politics behind humpty dumpty sat on a wall or twinkle twinkle little star you will be amazed that they are all political write ups or let's take the case of the red hood the red red and hood or the fox and the girl or even that uh, beauty and the beauty and the beast all these write ups play a pivotal role in reinforcing the existing social stereotypes into the small brains so further studies especially during the late 20th century i say the late 20th century because that was a time when post modernism flourished retelling of narratives and reexamination of narratives scrutiny of narratives happened a classic example again that i could give you apart from this indian writing stuff is uh, a novel titled snow white written by donald bartholme i would recommend you to read that it is not walt disney snow white it is not the girl who lived with five dwarfs and waited for the prince charm but this is more of a serious snow white of exploitation of physical assault of 
poverty and misery and several other things. So postmodernism reinvented several seemingly harmless child narratives. And they tried to see us in a different light. And there was also this realization that if you want to change the society, apart from writing systems like Chinua Chabe or R.K. Narayan or Rabindranath Tagore, it is also equally important to write children's fiction. Because they are the prime audiences that you can take. Like we say, catch them young. So those are the brains that needs to be corrected as early as we could. And uh, that is something that some authors have later in the, in the, in the, in the uh, span of literary career realized and changed. I won't, I won't make further dig digressions because I know I have taken almost 45 minutes in this introduction. And we have three stories of Naskin Bond to deal with today. But then very quickly, let me also give you an instance of, because I told there are writers who shift to children's fiction. A classic example is another author whom you would come across in MEG 40. Her name is Maha Shweta Devi. You would have come across her short stories or a play like Mother of 1084 during your graduation days. She is an exceptional short story writer or a prose writer for that sake. A work like Stanada Imi, translated by Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak into English as Breast Giver is another prime example. Or quite a lot of stories, including Salt, which is prescribed for your study in MAG 14. But at one point, Mahashweta Devi realizes that it is equally important to be reasonable to children, equally along with appealing to the adult, adolescent masses. She comes up with a book, and the title is really something that you would love. There is this, there is that curiosity right there in the title. The Why Why Girl. In Hindi, it is it is translated as the Kyun Kyun Ladki. So uh, the Why Why Girl is a series that she came up with. It's a picture book, a children's book written by Mahashweta Devi. It was published in 2003. It is, it, it, would, it would be really hard to believe that someone who writes works like Mother of 1084 or Salt or Sanadaini can come up with such simple yet far, you know, impactful works like the Why Why Girl. And then comes the name is Bond, Ruskin Bond. You may be familiar with the name again during your school days. Just like we say Malgudi when we hear R.K. Narayan. The moment we hear Ruskin Bond, we say Masuri. We would have come across, say, for instance, the, sto the, the, the story like uh, The Girl on the Train, where a girl who is blind gets into a train and uh, he, uh, she meets a guy who is also blind and they speak to each other without knowing that they are blind until they get out, of the, uh, out at the station. Then there is a story, I forgot the name of the story, there is a story where there is a fruit seller, fruit seller girl in a railway station. So the narrator on his way meets this fruit seller, fruit seller in that station every single time. And uh, one time while he was traveling, he didn't meet her, she was missing. And there are quite a lot of such amazing short stories that Ruskin Bond has written. If not all the three, at least a few of the stories that are prescribed in your MEG7 book is not actually what may be in traditional terms deal, uh, deemed to be academic short stories. Rather, they are children's fiction. If you, if you, if you, if you try to get hold of the short stories, I'll have a glimpse for you in a minute or two so that you would realize what I'm trying to convey better. Yes, I'll share my screen and show you something. This is the Google edition of An Island of Trees, a story that is prescribed to you in MEG7. And if you try to get hold of this, of course, you don't have the entire pages for free in Google. But nonetheless, this is how that book unfolds. And I hope my page is visible to you. As I scroll down, 
just have a look at this. An illustration. And then there is this narration. Simple language, mind you. If you have a baby, that baby would read this to me. And if you are still not reading it, there's a crime. Look at the illustrations. Look how simple the language is, the diction is, the plot development is. And look how appealing the language is. If you are a child and if you like this fantasy, look how it caters to your brain. One day the trees will move again. They have been standing still for thousands of years, but one day they will move again. There was a time when trees could walk about like people. Then along came a terrible demon and cast a spell over them, rooting them to one place, but they are always trying to move. See how they reach out with their arms. See, this is the storytelling narrator. This is a storytelling mode. If you have a baby and if you're telling a story to a baby, this is how you narrate stories full of images, full of fantasy. So that's what Ruskin Bond does. And this is a story, this is one of the stories that is described for your perusal. Not more than 10, 15 pages, but very simple, very not too complex, comprehensible, illustrative. So this is what we are dealing with. So traditionally, canonically, children's fiction was considered to be less glamorous. People thought of it to be something, ha, children's fiction, for children. But then over the years, at least over the last five to six decades, children's fiction have reinforced its prominence and children's fiction have gathered a significant role in its impact or its prospective impactfulness to the society. And Ruskin Bond is one of those writers who has exploited this to the core. Maybe exploited is a derogatory term, maybe explode would be better. Pardon me and I correct myself. Ruskin Bond is a writer who has explored this to its best possible ways. I'll tell you why. Ruskin Bond as a young boy, lost his father. Again, would be highly resonant of Charles Dickens. He lost his father. He was under his stepfather, whom he disliked. And he used to travel to his grandparents every now and then. And he loved those train journeys. And Mussori was an integral part of his life. And all his stories are basically about Mussori. But that's not where it ends. In a world where we live in, full of rapid industrialization, further development, and this dichotomy of development versus sustainable environment. Sir, oh. sir, sorry for instruments. Sir, I've shared your class link in another group. They are asking that which RC is it? It's RC Cochin, but they can join. I think this is open for all learners across India. Yes, sir. So, coaching, see, spelling? C O C H I N, R C coaching. Okay. You could see a participant okay. in the group as well. That is the admin sharing from R C coaching. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, where were I? I was talking to you about something. Are you here? Are you listening to me? Uh, I'm pretending... bond, uh, explore, was exploring all these things. Yeah, he was exploring all these things and most importantly, I, I, was to, I, I was talking about how industrialization and development and everything creates problems uh, from, a, from the nature's perspective. Again, Malayalis would be able to recollect a recent instance where uh, an elephant called Arikomban had to be captured and uh, translated, transported to another uh, place because he came out of the forest. The other side, the harsh side is that it's not the animals who come out of the forest, but it's we humans who explore and who take over the forests and uh, they are left choiceless than to come out open. So in a world where we are exploiting our natural resources, where needless to say, 
we are exploiting our environment, environmental degradation, deforestation, everything is on a peak. Global warming is taking a toll. Reports claim that over the next five years, we'll experience the severe uh, heat during the uh, summer. Major issue is indeed related to the environment. So Ruskin bought when he sees Masuri and Dara Doom and how the forest and wildlife is being exploited by men, especially hunters within his family as well as others, uses writing as a tool to speak against us. Again, I've had hundred digressions enough, but one more because I keep remind I keep forgetting a lot of things. So at a peak time I get remembered, okay, I missed one more. So just one more digression. We spoke about the Untouchable, a novel by Raja Rao, a few sessions back. We spoke about how caste system functions in India. Ruskin Bond started writing at an age of 10. At an age of 18, he bagged his first prestigious award. And then, so one of his early short stories as a child is titled The Untouchable. And I would rather urge you to read that story. It's a very simple story. Two friends, one is a rich boy, the other is a poor boy, and the poor boy is not welcome. And the rich boy doesn't talk to the poor boy. But then when the poor boy, the rich boy is left alone and uh, uh, it's heavily raining, he had to take refuge in the poor boy's place, which is kind of leaking because of the rain. And uh, the rich boy is privileged and the poor boy, despite being of the same age, struggles. So, yeah. So, um, The Untouchable by uh, Ruskin Bond would definitely give you a good, interesting read a comparative read, maybe with Raja Rao, not as complex as Raja Rao, not too deep, but with, that's that's again something that leads to what Wengade said: the difference in characterization, plot development, and complication between novel and short story. The two untouchables would be a good comparative read for sure. So yeah, I was trying to tell you that uh, Ruskin Bond, at a very young age, has written a short story called Untouchable. I've given the link to you. For those who joined late, I don't mind sharing that link once again. You may access that link later. And just in case you are not able to, feel free to ask me. I'll share the, what do you call, uh, links in the WhatsApp group. And, uh, yeah. One more link that I wanted to share with you is this one called 40 famous books by Ruskin Bond. Again, not purely academic. Uh, Prema ma'am has joined. Ma'am, mm -hmm. ma'am, one more thing. This is also for the benefit of others who don't know Malayalam. My, this is my, yeah. uh, uh, my query regarding the yeah. examination point of view. Uh, mm -hmm. Can we, uh, if we concentrate more on the questions that has been asked for our assignment, can we score mm -hmm. a decent mark? Yeah. Of course, uh, so there will be some questions uh, which are uh, uh, included in the question paper, but in a different way. The, not, the questions will not be asked as such, and it is better to download the old question papers. So every okay. year, June and December, you are having exam. So if you take five years question papers, print out all the question papers, there is a portal, old question papers, student support, le poya kanam. Adilna, you can download five years question paper. Five so, years I am asking paper. about the assignment questions that has been asked okay. for this year. Oh. Yeah, that's what I have told first. Assignment questions, some of the questions may be repeated in other way. Not in the same okay. manner, but the okay, content will be asked in some other as the, some other questions. So it is always okay. better to write the assignments. Okay, the assignment okay. questions okay. will not be asked as such and all the assignment questions will not be asked. But some of them, about 30 to 40 percent of the assignment questions will be asked, but in a different manner. Okay. okay. So that's why we are, we are emphasizing that you have to write the assignments of your own and also look into the old question paper. Sure, okay. Then both, okay if you, you do both these assignments and even the assignments of the last years also, you can uh, download and see. 
So assignments will be different for each each year. Okay, that also can be done. Okay, so okay, going okay. through the old old question paper, old assignment questions, you I think you can get uh, you can score more than sixty percent. But you should sure, be thorough with the study material. Study material, ningle each and every word you have to write, because all the questions will be based on the uh, uh, as I, I mean uh, study material. Okay. Whatever mm. reference you do, of course that is good. But the study material should be the base or the backbone of your study. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Okay. Thank you, so, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. So I've been lecturing for a long time. So maybe let's get started with something really childish. There is this animated version of Ruskin Bond story prescribed for you, a very small one. So let's have a look at it. I'm showing that because there are three stories. Two of them are thematically united. The third one is slightly an odd one out. So we'll explore the third one and then come back and quickly go to the remaining two and call it a day. Okay. I'm sharing my screen to you now. And uh, let's watch that and come back. Copperfield in the jungle is the short story. The second short story. Where Ruskin Bond prescribing your blocks. Biographical one, and it has two main characters. Ruskin Bond is a 12 year old boy and his uncle Henry. The other characters are Uncle Henry's friends and Ruskin Bond's grandfather. Bond begins his story by telling us that he never liked hunting. Perhaps he was influenced by his grandfather, who could not understand the pleasure some people got from killing animals of the forests. Birds and animals had as much right to live as humans. Bond found hunting extremely boring. He narrates an experience when once Uncle Henry took him to the Tirai forests on a hunting expedition. The prospect of spending one whole week in the jungle with several adults with guns filled him with dismay. They would only talk about hunting a tiger or an elephant and he did not look forward to it. On the second day of the expedition, he managed to be left behind at the rest house and during the morning's exploration of the bungalow, he discovered a shelf of books half hidden in the corner of the back veranda. Bond wondered who had left the books there. There were some 30 volumes which had been untouched for many years. Since his reading tastes had not yet formed, he was willing to try anything and the bookshelf was varied in its contents. On that day, he discovered P.G. Woodhouse and read Love Among the Chickens. By the time the perspiring hunters came home late in the evening with their spent cartridges and lame excuses, he had already started reading Ghost Stories of an Antiquary by M.R. James. The next morning, the Shikharis set out for a different area to bag a tiger. They had employed a party of villagers to beat the jungle and all day Bond could hear their drums throbbing in the distance. In the meantime, he finished reading M.R. James and discovered another book called A Naturalist on the Prowl by Edward Hamilton Aitken. Bond says that his concentration was disturbed only once when he looked up and saw a spotted deer crossing the open clearing in front of the bungalow. The deer disappeared among the sal trees and he returned to reading his book. In the evening, the party of hunters returned from the hunt and said that they would bag the tiger the next day. They were very excited because they had seen a spotted deer. Now there were only three days left and he knew that he would never get through the entire bookshelf. So Bond chose David Copperfield, his first encounter with Charles Dickens. Ruskin Bond makes a list of all the main characters in David Copperfield. He says that this book by Charles Dickens set him off on the road to literature. Bond identified with young David Copperfield. He wanted to grow up and become a writer like him. We know that David Copperfield is a veiled autobiography of Charles Dickens. But then Bond says that on the second day when he was reading the book, an event occurred which disturbed his reading for a little while. He says that on the previous day he had noticed a number of stray dogs about the house waiting for scraps of food to be thrown away. These stray dogs belonged to the watchmen, the villagers and the forest guards. Around 10 o'clock in the morning, a time when wild animals seldom came into the open, 
he heard a sudden yelp in the clearing. Looking up, he saw a large leopard making off into the jungle with one of the dogs held in its jaws. He says that the leopard had either been driven towards the house by the beaters or had watched the party leave the bungalow and decided to help itself to a meal. Bond says that he did not see any point in raising an alarm about this because he realized that the leopard had only helped itself to a meal. And he did not want anything to interrupt his reading. So he returned to reading David Copperfield. The Shikaris returned late that evening. They were dirty, sweaty and as usual disappointed. They were supposed to return to the city the next day and none of them had anything to show for a whole week in the jungle. They were discussing that there was no game left in the jungle and that the weather was very beastly. Then Bond told them that he had seen a leopard that morning. But the hunting party refuses to believe him. They attribute his overactive imagination to the influence of Dickens in his vivid portrayal of Master Copperfield. Bond says that he went to bed early that day and left the hunters to their tales of the good old days when rhinos, cheetahs and possibly even the legendary phoenix were still available for slaughter. The next day the camp broke up and they went their different ways. Bond was still halfway through David Copperfield and he saw no reason to leave the book behind to gather dust for another 30 years. So he took the book home with him. He says that he still has it as a reminder of how he failed as a shikari but launched himself on a literary career. And with that, we come to the end of the story, Copperfield in... All right. I share the link of that video here with just in case you wanna go back to that. But then the simple, again, as I told you, these are all children's fiction, so it's not too high, too big things or anything. But then if you look at the plot, Ruskin Bond with his grandfather went to a place and there were people and they went hunting. And just like his grandfather, Ruskin Bond didn't like to go hunting. We should note the stark difference between what he sees in the later part of time where a, a leopard hunts a deer. So he has no objections with it. If a creature has to hunt for its survival, he has no problems with it. But Ruskin Bond is against the human pride or unnecessary, uh, you, what do you call, uh, showmanship by uh, taking it to hunting. So he stays back and uh, he reaps rewards by reading. And uh, it is autobiographical and he claims that that phase didn't make him a hunter as they all wanted him to be, but rather it made him a writer. Again, a few things to be noted in that short story is that this is a plain narrative that we witnessed right now. If you read, you will be watching, you will be reading the same narrative. But we, we should pause a moment and wonder who would have set up a library like that in that Shikari house? Like in that house where people would go to go hunting and spend holidays. Who would have probably set up a library? So it could have been someone like Ruskin Bond, an elderly person like his grandpa, grandfather who hated hunting or it would have been the wife of someone, a hunter who hated hunting just like Ruskin Bond does, who wanted to pass her time as her husband went hunting. Possibly. But then these are also aspects that we need to think about. Also look at the choice of short stories, oh, sorry, the choice of books that he reads. David Copperfield, is in itself a semi-autobiographical piece of Charles Dickens. And Ruskin Bond, in his work, gets inspired by reading the semi-autobiographical work of a non-Indian writer and turns into writing. So that's a power of magic that literature holds. And again, the story, even though I said it's an odd one out compared to the other two stories, this particular story is actually is something that cautions us against 
or against interventions in the natural surroundings. Jungle belongs to uh, animals, and the human intervention makes it difficult for women, uh, for animals to survive. And Ruskin bought through this very subtle plot and subtle narration tries to remind how important it is to not be vain glorious or boastful but rather focus on creative things like for instance reading books in an era when we look back and we see that reading is kind of becoming extinct among the adolescents hooked to mobile phones Ruskin Bond's advice would turn golden because there is no intellectual growth without reading and if our adolescents do not have that intellectual growth what will happen it will be a disaster again a couple of references before we move on to the next two short stories talking about um yes so there is this essay called does it matter by richard leakey i would recommend you to have a light read of an essay because if you read that essay you can answer quite a lot of stories which deals with this environmental concerns so richard leakey richard leakey talks about the two concepts on environmental concerns one is an anthropocentric view or anthropocentric views and the second is a deep ecological perspective deep ecology they are also part of this earth as much as we are so that is deep ecology so he speaks about how certain thinkers i forgot the name of the guy he refers to i'll get back to you maybe tomorrow because i kind of forgot the name of the person that he ridicules i think it's julian simon if i remember correctly so leakey says that some people like julian simon believe that the nature can correct itself no matter how much we plunder it he says that they believe they have this false optimism that nature will recuperate on its own and no matter how much we take from the nature the nature will spring again leakey cautions against such a callous attitude and leakey says that we should have a deep ecological perspective this earth is equally desirable to let's say a butterfly to a tiger or a human being so whoever inhabit this earth they are all equal stakeholders of the earth according to leakey and he tries to say that people like this guy uh, are uh, quite greedy capitalists crony capitalists who try to create such stupid excuses to suit their uh, capitalistic needs so whenever we speak about nature and ecological plunder even when we speak about chipko movement or plachimada strike and all we would easily go back to richard leakey's statements in dasit mat i can share it with you if you feel like if you want just a theoretical reference now very quickly let me get back to the remaining two stories by ruskin bond let's prescribe for your study first one is titled no room for a leopard and the last one is an island of trees again the titles are quite self revelatory that's another peculiarity of children's fiction the titles are self explanatory in nature so you have a short story which is titled no room for a leopard so what does ruskin bond mean when he says no room for a leopard does he say i mean do any of us give a room for a leopard at a house no that's not something that he means he speaks about how in a place like mussoorie nature and human beings used to remain in harmony they used to coexist harmoniously but then unfortunately some people started hunting and the moment hunters came 
the balance between humans and the other creatures started to dwindle and most importantly trust seemed to wane so in no room for a leopard we have a narrator again semi autobiographical probably ruskin bond who walked carelessly in the forests initially birds or other animals looked at him skeptically they flew away but the more they got accustomed to the boy they stayed still they were okay with him he used to walk through the forest meet animal see animals and uh, they didn't pay heed to each other they didn't disturb each other's harmonious living and used to mutually coexist and then the twist happens a group of leopards invade the forest they invade the forest and they go in search of a leopard why because back then in delhi the skin of leopard would fetch them quite a lot of rupees quite a lot of amount this profitability for the skin of animals especially leopard the tusk of elephants and so on and so forth encourage the hunters to indulge in hunting simultaneously this also resulted in these animals getting extinct at least some of you may remember that a pmo narendra modi had imported a few tigers from if i remember correctly uganda so why did he have to do that he has to bring say 5 to 10 leopards or tigers from an african country by air lifting them over the flight and deposit in a uh, jungle in india why should he do that precisely because their breed is getting extinct in india and the major responsibility owes with the hunters so ruskin bond the subtly hinting at this hunters profit craving activity so he says that because the leopard skin gave them a good amount the leopards explored the jungle in search of a leopard to hunt the leopard so on their way they see this young guy and asks him if he saw the leopard even though he had seen the leopard the young boy refuses to acknowledge that again the deep connection or deep bonding between young children and nature is something portrayed there the next day as he walks through the jungle he sees or he he feels something in a cave and he realizes that it's a leopard but again the leopard is calm the leopard doesn't attack the boy by being accustomed to the boy and humans who are not troublesome the leopard and the other creatures start to build a trust on human beings so upon seeing the human beings they don't frown or they don't hunt they don't kill them the very next day he sees the hunters carrying the leopard on their shoulders having shot them very jubilantly yelling out in success looking at the dead leopard's face or its eyes the narrator feels betrayed he feels that it is the trust generated by him of being a harmless human being that led to the undoing of the nature so no room for a leopard is basically a title which would make us think no room for a leopard where in its den in its jungle not in our den not in our rooms not in our city in its very own space in the jungle the leopard is being inhumanly hunted by a group of human hunters even a forest <coughs> is not a safe place for a leopard okay let's very quickly move on to the next story so moving from no room for a leopard the last one prescribed in your for your study is an island of trees an island of trees is a bit more of a prescriptive nature 
what happens with panjatantram tales or aesop's fables they are a sort of guidebook for learners for youngsters for kids on what to do and how to do full of vices and virtues so uh, an island of trees is in that sense prescriptive in nature in island of nature sorry island of trees i'm sorry an island of trees we have koki and her grandmother so we have koki and her grandmother and uh, we have her husband who passed away who keeps coming in the story intermittently so the story is in the form of a dialogue between koki and her grandmother they are sitting on a string cot in the shade of an old jackfruit tree and the grandmother talks about her father and his great love for trees and flowers she tells koki that she was convinced that plants and trees loved her father with as much tenderness as she loved them and sometimes she recalled the good old days where they sat beneath a tree and how she would you know overcome her loneliness and so on and so forth she went on to or she goes on to personify the trees she speaks about the people tree she speaks about uh an old people tree and how her father had rebuilt the temple around the tree and the tree around the temple and how the tree gained a sort of divinity and so on and so forth this may sound slightly <laughs> i'm sorry absurd for an adult's common sense but then from a child's point of view these are again tales that are of interest especially when we are of young age we are taken by our parents to temples and we are given quite a lot of stories and uh, we are told that our prayers would come through and then there would be these myths associated in various ways to make student uh, to make children not to do certain mischiefs so among that or amidst that we have this tale where uh, the tree was you know helped in such a way that the temple became the tree and the tree became the temple and how a forest came across due to koki's great grandfather their planting experience is been referred so unlike in no room for leopard where we could see an animosity towards animals among the human beings or especially the hunters in an island of trees we could see a pantheistic viewpoint again if you remember MEG1 and if you remember William Wordsworth's poems he brings up this pantheistic outlook p a n t h e i s t i c or i s m which way you want to pronounce it pantheistic or pantheism pantheism is worship of nature or god worship of nature as god <coughs> sorry ah, yeah so by the time the story reaches the climax the grandmother gets back to her old place and the animals look at them like strangers because they have not seen them but the moment she touches a tree she feels like they realize her they recognize her and she says that all the trees nod in approval because they had planted those trees and when she returns home they have turned into a jungle the small saps that they had planted have turned themselves into large thick dense forest jungles and they they approve or they recognize the grandmother as the story comes to an end among the collection of short stories that you have in mg7 these three stories by ruskin bond in an academic sense i must say in terms of its language is nothing but if you would love to explore the significance children's literature has gained over the last few decades if you want to explore how such small tales can sow seeds for a brighter future i'm using metaphorical language in tunes to what i'm teaching you right now okay if you realize how such small tales can sow seeds 
towards a brighter future. We are again talking about protecting environment in different stories. So sow seeds towards a brighter future by enlightening the children, very young, small brains, right from their beginning, trying to condition them to a eco-friendly outlook. Then that's what Ruskin Bond has tried to do. And that's what he is probably craved to achieve. And these three stories are standing testimonials to that efforts of Ruskin Bond. As I have already told you, this is not only the case of Ruskin Bond. People like Mahashweta Devi have turned from hard fiction to children's fiction. There are quite a lot of popular writers, caricature people, who delve deep into children's fiction. Children's books or comics are no longer deemed apolitical or harmless. They can induce their own politics in a positive sense, eco politics and eco feministic politics, a uh, uh, view towards preserving the environment through such pocket tales. And Ruskin Bond has been trying to do this all the way along. So that's it about those three stories. No, this is not the end. There are a few more references I'd like to add. We began today's session by a video by Ruskin Bond, inviting to a course on writing by Ruskin Bond. I herewith share the link of that course. The present offer is 999 rupees instead of 1500 rupees to have a lifetime access of all lessons from any device and to receive a certificate of completion. There are 28 lessons from Bond of about three and a half hours long. And trust me, I don't have any connections with Mugafi or Unlu. And uh, they are not paying me any royalties for you subscribing to that course. But just out of sheer goodwill and out of love for Ruskin Bond and the mission that he has. And also because I know some of you may be aspirant writers. You may want to set your foot into fantasy writing. Ruskin Bond is definitely a good starting point. And that's why I shared that link with you. And uh, you may also, if you don't want to pay and still want to learn how to become a good writer, you may also have a look at this lecture, again by Ruskin Bond, on how to become a writer. He's a legend for a reason. He, the way he's actually, literally he is, I began by saying Bond, James Bond. He's actually the James Bond of the literary world. And uh, the simplicity in language that he has is something that would, in all probability, attract you towards him. And uh, I request you to go through these links as well. Uh, I don't remember whether I shared the Google book link. It's not completely free, but then... So you may still have access to that from here as well. And uh, yeah, let me also, these are easily accessible in, I mean, this is already available in Google. You don't need me to share these links. But then I'm also sharing a few links just in case you haven't gotten there yet. These are a few pointers that would help you to appreciate MAG7 better. Also, let me see if I can send you that Richard Lee Key's essay. Just give me a second. Sir, I have a question. Like, I Yes, have please. I, I, was, I was just about to leave the floor open for questions. We have almost <laughs> completed the tour today. And uh, my, so, my throat is kind of giving me trouble. So I thought I'll have the Q&A open. Yes, go on. So since we are reading about nature and since it is an Indian English litera literature, so while you were talking about sir, that leopard, sir, so just I was uh, having some flash of thoughts in my mind. I couldn't listen to you. I was just thinking that don't like uh, people these days. We can see people talking about literature, Veda and all this. So don't we have uh, these uh, awareness about animals in our Indian literature like Veda and all? 
like not to harm the animals because no one talks about that uh see that's where the problem is when such deeds are committed against nature everybody knows that they are harming it but then those who harm nature have their own justifications that's why i, co- I quoted uh, from leaky he says that there are people who say that nature will recuperate its, itself in various ways even after hiroshima bombings things have fallen back to place so no matter what you take from nature nature can get back to its old shape so people make such excuses and fortunately or unfortunately power hierarchy also plays a major role you have a look at you know i'm in a public platform and the session is being recorded so i'm not sure how much i can take these names but look at any uh, developmental projects that happens across the nation whether it's a port or whether it's a road highways or whether it's an expansion project through the forest who are the names associated with it they are all the ambani's and adani's and the big wigs and their motive is always ulteriorly profit they are not here to really contribute to a holistic natural development of the world if let's say ambani or adani or anybody claims that we will give uh, water for free by taking all the rivers then that is a scam i'm not sure how many of you have seen this movie uh, it is a tamil movie i'm sure you would find the dubbed version somewhere in um, youtube it's a tamil movie starring an actor called karthi the name of the movie is uh, sarda the movie explores how the water mafia have ex- have kind of hijacked our resources just like air water is supposed to be something that is to be come to come to us for free but then these people put a charge to water saying the charge is not for water but for the plastic bottle that they give us so it was 5 rupees initially 10 15 now it's 20 and that is not completely healthy we say mineral water but if it's not you know preserved in a close environment if it's exposed to sunlight it can cause bacterial reactions so <laughs> the same case can be seen in different ways you speak about uh, bone vita or you speak about horlicks or boost or any other soft drink you speak, you speak about coca cola during my class i was referring to the plachimeda struggles yeah so all these can again be taken into consideration so who are in the lead so what is their motive so these stories from the way the see india is a, is, a, is a land which has this popular uh, phrase called vasudeva kudumbaga we are all one we humans animals pests everything bound together are the owners of this earth but then when it comes to such hierarchical power political exploitations all these things goes for a toss take the case of coal mines take the take the case of digging and exploitation that goes with the land mafia so all these are beyond one or a few people's armed revolt or or uh, combined efforts 